Okay, okay, okay. Ito mga kameta, medyo live na tayo ngayon. Uh, timing lang tayo dito sa corner. Pasensya na na medyo super late tayo nag-start. Uh, dahil uh, napatagal yung mga commuting natin dito. So, sobrang na-enjoy natin itong uh, pag-public uh, transportation dito sa Japan. Tuloy kung saan-saan tayo napunta. At uh, na-underestimate po natin uh, yung tagal ng biyahe at saka lakad-lakad from one direction to the other. At to be honest, sa sobrang mahal kasi ng taxi dito, parati mong gustong pilitin na mag-commute uh, ka na lang. Uh, kaso, ang complicated kasi yung pagkakommute kung marami kang dala, marami kang bagahe. At minsan, mahirap magkamali. Especially, of course, may konting language barrier tayo. Pero in fairness naman, I mean, uh, every technology and everything is there naman. Uh, in terms of making sure na makakuha ka ng tickets, makakuha ka ng kung nagkamali ka dun sa ticket mo, pwede mo rin paayusin yan. So, in fairness naman, uh, maayos lahat. Pero, yun nga, minsan, yung transits between line this, line that, yung meta color line, yung Sarah green line, yung PBM red line, yan. Magkakamali-mali ka minsan na. Anyway, uh, so pasensya na medyo talagang ang dami natin ninegotiate and navigate uh, in terms of uh, traveling and transportation dito. Malaking syudad kasi ng Tokyo talaga. Eh. I mean, this is the biggest city in the world pagdating sa, uh, you know, in terms of uh, uh, density of population. I think lampas sa 30 million ang uh, mga tao nakatira sa Tokyo. So it's a very densely populated area at mahirap talaga uh, itong mga uh, transportation sometimes. But anyway, uh, let's talk about this. Let's talk about etong desperation sa Pilipinas. Kasi ako, every time nandito ako sa mga ibang asya ng bansa na maunlad or umunlad dati pa, di ba? Uh, lalong mapapaisip ka na ano ba nangyayari sa Pilipinas? Ano ba talaga nangyayari sa Pilipinas? So, speaking of the Philippines, mga comments, um, you know, I found something interesting. So, kanina umaga, uh, nung, actually hapon noon, nung dumadaan tayo sa Shinjuku area, papunta kasi ako dun sa Nikkei Asia. Of course, uh, yung iba sa inyo, alam niyo naman na contributor ako sa Nikkei Asia, yung major business and politics publication dito sa Tokyo. So, on the way, duman-duman tayo kung saan-saan. And then, may isang area dyan sa may Shinjuku. Very interesting. Makikita mo yung mga pictures ng Shinjuku District in Tokyo noong 1960s and 1970s. At doon mo talaga makikita na napaka-humble yung beginnings ng Japan. No? Uh, not 100 years ago, not 80 years ago, kahit 56 years ago, 50, 60 years ago pa lang pag makita mo yung Japan, Parang Manila nga eh, di ba? Uh, actually, para mas mahirap pa nga sa Manila. Of course, you know, Japan was heavily devastated by the Second World War. Pero mapabilib ka rin sa kanila na from semi-squatter condition. In fact, may mga areas dyan sa, I think, Shinjuku and Shibuya na dati, agricultural land. No? This is like 1960s, 50, 60 years ago. Ngayon, titignan mo yung area na yan. Parang uh, it looks like an um, post-industrialized city, di ba? Uh, ibig sabihin niyan, uh, masasense mo talaga na itong bansa na ito yumaman ng matagal at ngayon nakikita mo yung next phase of economic development nilang. Kasi iba yung ano eh, uh, iba yung itsura ng mga bansa na ngayon lang yumaman. Diba? So kung pumunta ka sa Dubai, pumunta ka sa China, diba? uh, pumunta ka sa mga bansa na ngayon lang umuunlad or mga past 20, 30 years, mag-feel mo talaga new rich. And speaking of Tokyo, yes, Tama, Mario. Hindi ako, pero yung Japan, uh, old money ang dating ng Japan. In fact, makikita mo rin yan dun sa fashion ng mga Hapon, di ba? Ang fashion nila is very elegant, simple, zen, which is kind of similar to fashion na makikita mo sa mga ibang lugar, katulad ng Scandinavian countries. You know, Sweden, Denmark, uh, even some of the more posh parts sa Germany, like München, for instance, yung Munich. So, for me talaga, Sobrang impressive how far Japan has come, only 50, 60 years. Having said that, of course, in conversations natin dito was how Japan is being left behind. Actually, pag tinignan mo yung, um, pag, uh, yes, Tunisia, Morocco, actually, I can name a number of other countries. Turkey, I think Turkey would be a very good example of a kind of a newly middle class, semi-wealthy society kung nakita mo yung kanilang airport. Pero new, kung new rich talaga, Persian Gulf na yan. Uh, Dubai, Qatar, a bit Bahrain, di ba? Uh, in fact, even some parts of India, Mumbai, uh, may kita mo yan. Anyway, going back to this, 
ang discussion kasi dito sa Japan is hindi na sila nag-innovate masyado. Now, bilang isang mas matandang millennial, obviously naalala ko yung time na yung Japan po ay representation ng coolness, innovation and all of that. Pero, uh, pero, um, aminin natin pagdating dito sa Japan, I, uh, they're being left behind by Korea. Uh, in particular, and increasingly also by China. China, in terms of certain technologies, scale, so last year, natalo ng Japan as the world's biggest exporter of cars ng China. But obviously, a big part of that was because ang laki ng export ng China sa Russia, for instance. No, uh, I think Russia is importing more than two-thirds of its entire automobiles from China alone. So that bumped up the total exports of China. But if you look at China's BYD, EV, electronic vehicle car, it's also number one in the world right now and it beat uh, Tesla. So the future is very bright for Chinese gigantic companies and, and Japan is really feeling the pressure. Pagdating naman sa South Korea, actually last year, South Korea, for the very first time, naging mas mayaman sa Japan in terms of per capita income. Right? And if you look at South Korea, naalala ko yung conversation natin dun sa isang top leader ng Korean parang chamber of industries. Ito yung grupo ng mga Chable, Samsung, uh, you know, LG, yung lahat ng mga kilala natin mga yan, di ba? Ito yung mga BTS ng Korean industry. And uh, naalala ko, parang, ano lang, parang nonchalant sinabi niya, ay wala, talo namin Japan, hindi sila makaabol sa amin dahil hindi sila innovative enough. So, so you can see there's a sense, there's a kind of a laboring, lumbering, um, uh, semi-stagnant aspect to Japan, no? But having said that, uh, it's still a very wealthy country uh, compared to a lot of Asian countries. It still has an, a lot of depth and elegance to it that you cannot find in any other Asian country. And most importantly, para sa atin mga Pilipino, it's a country that still wants to invest big time, big, big time, sa so Southeast Asia, sa ASEAN region, and especially uh, sa Pilipinas. Uh, yan may mga uh, nag-wine dyan na medyo iba yung titles. Just listen to me, kasi, okay? I'm, everything is gonna be connected, all right? Uh, it's it's midnight now, okay? Bung araw tayo naglalakad and all of that, okay? Masyadong picky. Anyway, um, Japan wants to invest big in Southeast Asia. Naturally, dapat Pilipinas yung number one destination na investment sa Japan. Kung malala nyo. 1960s pa lang, alright? Ito yung time na nagtitake off ang Japan, pinili nila ang Manila as the headquarters of Asian Development Bank. Dahil tayong pinaka, pinaka mahalagang bansa in terms of economic potential at in terms of uh, average gross domestic product growth. Pero guys, parati pagkausap ko yung mga Hapon, sinasabi nila sa akin, bakit ganyan ang Pilipinas? Nasa sayangan sila. Okay? Ngayon, madudugtong natin yung mga seemingly divergent titles. Okay, guys? Kasi, hindi kasi kayo marunong. Mahirap kasi sa different algorithms you have to... Anyway, long story. Long story short, ang, ang position ng mga Hapon is what's going on with the Philippines. So, for a very long time, meron silang structural problems sa Pilipinas. At yung structural problem nila sa Pilipinas is yung mga oligarchs, hawak nila yung mga key sectors of the economy. So, abnormally expensive ang electricity sa Pilipinas. Napaki. Meral ko nga, may mga commercial-commercial po nga eh. uh, Abnormally expensive ang fuel sa Pilipinas dahil super deregulated yung oil prices and yung mga oil companies sa Pilipinas. Happy time na naman sila. Pag konting akit ang presyo sa international markets, iakit nila ng migla. And then, pag sobrang bumaba, i-konti nilang, ibaba nila ng konti. Pero, alam nyo na guys. So, in short, ang problema sa Pilipinas is, minsan parang walang may-are ang bansa. Alright? Ang hina ng regulation. Ang hina ng, in terms of providing direction for the country. A very minimal industrial and trade policy. Alright? Uh, I can go on and on about that. But, but, yung isa pang malaking concern nila sa Pilipinas is yung mga politiko natin yung mga klaseng politiko na ineelect natin. And I'll be brutally honest, nung ineelect natin si Digong, napaganyan yung mga ibang kasa- mga kaibigan natin. But of course, 
Alam niyo naman, mga hapon, very polite. Mga Asian countries, very sensitive. From Singapore to Japan. So, nung si Digong ang presidente, sige, hug sila, smile sila, mga ganun. Uh, dahil, ala, ay, ah, syempre, yung iba, lalong Japan, ay nila yung Pilipinas, maging province of China. O, alam niyo na yung reference point natin dyan, di ba? And then, nung nanalo naman si BBM, yung iba sa kanila, napaganyan. Parang, ano ba nangyari <laughs> sa pansang to? Kasi, ewan ko sa inyo, pero sa Japan, sa mga tao na alam nila yung mga basic facts, yung medyo nag-self-educate naman ng konti, alam na alam nila na sobrang kurakot yung time ng dictatorship natin. Na while yung mga Hapon, mga Koreano, yung Taiwanese, Chinese, Vietnamese, lahat mga yan, nung may time na may authoritarian leadership sila or meron pa rin sa China and Vietnam, actually their authoritarian leaders were so patriotic and competent that they build the foundations of their high-level manufacturing industries and all of that. Pagdating sa Pilipinas, every time nagkaroon tayo ng dictatorial leader, authoritarian leader, mas palpak pa minsan, or actually mas palpak pa, dun sa mga ibang hindi dictatorial leader na hindi rin naman ganun kagaling. So, yun po yung masaklap sa Pilipinas. So, napapaisip sila na nangyayari sa Pilipinas. And then, this week, alright, habang nandito tayo, kausap natin ng mga kaibigan natin ng mga others, biglang nangyari itong bardagulan ni Digong at saka uh, BBM. At kung tignan nyo naman guys, grabe na ito para mga bata, di ba? I mean, nagahamon yung isa mag-drug test, uh, yung isa, o, oh, pahingan nyo lang yan. <laughs> I mean, to be honest, of course, in fairness, I think President Marco Jr. was the gentleman here. And I think President Marco Jr. even though na-annoyed siya, na- napaganyan siya um, you know he tried to control himself and he's looking at the big picture he's looking at the country but but the fact na dumating tayo sa ganitong situation where an ex-president and a sitting president are exchanging barbs like this exchanging insults like this sobrang pangit talaga tingnan nito para sa ating bansa alright sobrang pangit nang hindi ko sinasabi na perfecto yung mga Uh, yung mga kapitbahay natin. Sa Vietnam, actually ngayon, may semi-purge yung nangyari sa mga top economies nila natanggal. Uh, I can go on and on. Dito sa Japan, napakababa yung popularity ni Kishida administration. Sa Korea, dami rin mga polarization dun sa conservative Trumpian president nila. And then parang sinaksak pa yata yung isang opposition leader nila nung isang buwan. So, I'm, I'm not romanticizing. Of course, Thailand, my goodness, Kaya horror, especially grabe pa yung situation sa Myanmar. Indonesia is getting uh, nearing uh, the end of a crazy election season and a TikTok, TikTok. Nag-ubat-ubat pa yata si Prabowo. Nag-shirtless, shirtless Putin style. I mean, Malaysia, my goodness. Baka alam nyo na, ito yung bansa na parating may mga nakakasuhan ng sodomy. Uh, kung galit yung mga uh, gobyerno sa opposition leaders. So, I have no illusions about the craziness of politics in Asia and our region. All right, Even in the semi-democracies. And Taiwan naman, ang masaklap naman sa Taiwan is, medyo matino yung bansa, medyo matino yung demokrasya, pero hindi naman sila nirecognize bilang isang fully-fledged sovereign country. Right? So may diplomatic relationship ang maraming countries Taiwan, but without the full recognition of Taiwan as a sovereign state. And sobrang magulo yung polarizing din yung election nila actually uh, this year. Uh, compared even to the previous years no? or even previous cycles. But anyway, having said all of those things, guys, ito yung nakaka-frustrate pagdating sa Pilipinas. Dito talaga ako nakaka-frustrate over and over and over again. Pag tinignan mong Pilipinas, we have something very weird. In spite of all the craziness of our politics, in spite of all of the structural problems we have, in spite of all of these oligarchic uh, obstacles that we have to economic growth and all, The fact of the matter is that the Philippines is still the fastest growing economy in Southeast Asia. So actually guys, we were able to beat all our competitors in ASEAN again. This is I'm pang ilang beses na three or four times na yan in the past decade. The number one na naman tayo guys sa region natin. And we are expected to even be more ahead of our neighbors in 2024. So this is a very good graph na may kita niyo guys. This is a graph na ipakita ko. So, makikita yung Pilipinas sa gitna. Uh, on the left side, that's the, the, the lighter blue. I'm um, sorry. On, the, on the, the darker blue is 2023. And the lighter blue is 2024 forecast. So, makikita mo na king ang Pilipinas. Number one. But obviously, there's a context to that, guys. There's a context to that. This is ASEAN 5, by the way. Alright, ASEAN 5. 
So hindi kasama dito yung um, Vietnam, if I'm not mistaken. But we still, I think, have a faster growing economy than Vietnam also. Now, having said that, pansin nyo, parang di natin ramdam masyado eh. Siyempre, ramdam yan ng mga mayayaman, mga conglomerates, the 40 richest family that take home what? Uh, 60-70% of newly created growth based on the numbers we have from World Bank. Sila, ramdam, ramdam, ramdam na ramdam nila yung mga mayayaman sa Pilipinas. Pero tayo, mga ordinaryong tao, and lalo na yung mga mas ordinaryo pa sa... I mean, di naman tayo, wag naman tayo magpanggap tatay style. I mean, middle class naman ako eh. So, you know, I have no shame in being a middle class. I'm very proud of being middle class. So, yes. So, isipin mo, lalong-lalo na yung sitwasyon ng ating mga kababayan na masa. Right? People without cushion. Philippines has one of the lowest rates of people having even a bank account. Right? Kasi to have a bank account, and daming paperwork, tapos kailangan mo ng deposit, etc. Marami sa ating mga kabayan are constantly in debt and we have one of the lowest saving rates for a developing country. And let's not forget, para sa Pilipinas, to grow at the rate we're growing, which is 5.56%, dapat, duh! Dahil ang baba ng per capita income natin, $4,000 barely po, yung per capita income natin. Kung na-divide mo yung buong economy, natin, exactly by our population you only get $4,000 per Filipino so yung mga ibang nagsasabi, hindi mayaman ang Pilipinas, hindi lang, hindi actually ang, ang, ang masaklap dito is hindi tayo mayaman tapos yung kakaunti pa na mararating sa bawat Pilipino hindi dumarating dahil ginagobble up ng mga oligarchs at political dynasties at yun po yung konteksto ng usapin natin kaapon kung saan sinabi ko na good luck dyan sa gusto mag-federalize dyan sa iba because kung tinignan mo yung mga datos actually, almost 80% ng revenues, taxes ng buong gobyerno ng Estado ng Pilipinas ay galing lang sa NCR, Calabar Zone essentially from National Capital Region and the greater industrial region around it. So sobrang liit po yung resources, revenue generation capacity ng marami sa ating mga kababayan in other parts of the country, especially in Mindanao right? So, without the subsidy, de facto subsidy and support from the national government, lalo mahihirapan yung mga kaubayan natin sa Mindanao, especially into a certain degree in Visayas. And the thing is this, guys, you, you have to also keep this in mind. Uh, uh, whatever, I, I cannot control the internet connection. You mga guys na complain complain guy, I do not control the internet connection, alright? I'm just doing my best here. Wait, sino ba mga to? Wait, what is happening here? Hi. Next. Bakit ganun yung TikTok ko? Ba't may ibang tao? Wait lang. Bakit ganun yung TikTok? I mean, pwede makikilive yung ibang tao sa'yo? What's going on here? Okay, anyway, sorry. Balikan natin itong topic na ito guys Balikan natin itong topic na ito Importanteng topic na ito Okay anyways Hindi ko alam kung anong nahawakan ko dyan Bahala kayo dyan Ito let's go back to this topic guys Ano to? Bakit may mga ibang kasama ako dito? <laughs> Never mind I Disconnect na <laughs> Okay Ganito guys um, So we're growing very fast But that's like whatever considering how how low yung per capita natin and actually 6% is far from enough considering how you know big yung problem of poverty and inequalities in the Philippines the other thing na very shocking also sa Pilipinas guys is this pag tinignan mo yung Pilipinas ang mahal ng cost of living actually uh, dito sa Tokyo na to no na isa sa mga pinaka expensive cities on earth with 2 300 pesos so that's around a thousand yen, you actually can get pretty decent good food. Very high quality, pretty decent good food. Uh, good luck getting that in, in Manila, to be honest. No, especially dun sa el el bit middle class or upper middle class, or especially yung mga CBD areas, uh, central business districts and all. So I, I was just in Shibuya, uh, Ginza, uh, I, was in, uh, I was in Shinjuku, etc. So major business district to mga to. If you look at mga to, diba? If you look at mga districts na ito, uh, you know, with 1,000 yen, I could I could get a pretty decent meal. Actually, more than a decent meal. Very good meal. Um, and yung, yung traveling, you with, with, um, 
So I went, my goodness, I went from Shinjuku and then I went to the another business district and then I went all the way to to Sky Tree, Sky Sky Tree Ben, uh, Tokyo, come came back. I don't ilang kilometers na yan. Ang ginastos ko lang siguro 250 pesos total. Dahil sa commuting and all of that. That was ang bilis, napaka-efficient and all of that. So, my goodness, guys. I mean, grabe. Next level itong uh, next level itong uh, demokrasya natin. Ay, next level yung yung cost of living sa Pilipinas. Mag-grab ka lang from Makati to Quezon City, makakapo. Mak uh, makanong makano nang gagastos gagastos si mo uh, uh, saan ka na makaabot niyan with with 2 300 pesos kung magagrab ka or anything like that and good luck also with our public transportation now let me get back again to to my center point sorry i'm just trying to fix some of these things let me show you another important data so if you look at the philippines we're doing really bad in terms of attracting investments so i'll show you another graph guys Really, really bad. Na weirdo pa rin ako sa TikTok. Ano yan? Nakiki live yung ibang tao sa yo. They can join live with you. I think I pressed something um, mistakenly and then I was like joined. <laughs> if you talk to people anyway. Anyway, um, what on earth is that? Tapos yung mga nag join live pa sa akin parang hindi naman Pilipino. Eh, kaya nga ako nagtatagalog para. Clearly, uh, uh, clear, yung parental preference natin ang Pilipinas. Ito guys, ha, kung titignan mo ito, sobrang kulelat ng Pilipinas. Sobrang baba yung FDI sa Pilipinas. Alright? Sobrang baba yung FDI. So, kitang-kita mo, no much na no much tayo sa Singapore, all the indicates of Singapore naman, if you look at it. Uh, Singapore is understandable because actually it's a conduit and hub for investments. And usually, the investments that goes into Singapore gets spread across the region. But we're lower than Indonesia, we're lower than Malaysia, we're lower than Thailand, and based on the some of the data I saw, actually Vietnam gets more than twice uh, uh, the level of investments that we get. Uh, and and the thing though is, what Vietnam is getting is investment in very high quality, very very high quality. Carlson, na post ko yan yung link, okay? Magbasa kayo dyan, okay? Ayan na naman tayo, nagmamaganda kayo ah. Alas, that was a nice question. Alright, kasi nag eh. Yung PCIJ report po, pinost natin yan in terms of revenue collection. It's a PCIJ study. Okay? Ito, send ko ang link dito. Andyan yan, pinost ko sa baba. Dun sa isang ano natin. Yan kasi kayo eh. Kasi post ko again later on. I, anyways, the graph is there. Are you questioning my data? Uh, going back to this, so sobrang baba yung level of FDI sa Pilipinas. And you've compared to Vietnam, which is almost at the same level of per capita income. Not only does Vietnam get more than twice our invest, uh, FDI level, it gets very high quality investments. Investments that go into production of cars, uh, high-tech sector, increasingly to semiconductors, and all of that. So, anong relasyon nito sa politika natin? The good news, guys, though, guys, is this. Nung nandito ako sa Tokyo, may na mga nakausap tayo mga top officials from allied nations. And there are plans, actually, to make the Philippines part of a greater regional semiconductor production hub para maging mas konti yung uh, reliance ng Amerika uh, sa, sa China. At para yung China hindi magda-dominate ng semiconductor industry and not have access uh, to the most cutting-edge semiconductors. I also saw in the good news that uh, isa sa mga top officials ng Biden administration nagsabi na pinili ang Pilipinas out of, I think, uh, we're among nine key countries that will be recipient of subsidies and aid in their CHIPS Act. Ito yung Semiconductor CHIPS Act. So, What should we do? What should be done? So kahapon dun sa discussion natin, I made it very clear na the, the Republic of Davao or Republic of Mindanao, whatever, it's not the reason, it's not the solution, sorry. And there's no support for that as for, I don't know, and aside from Alvarez, I don't know, and Digong, Bangsamoro, yung mga taga Zambonga, different regions of Mindanao, lahat sila hindi sumama dito. In fact, a lot of them, 
want charter change. Not Bang Samoro, but politicos from the other side. You know, uh, Western Mindanao, uh, other regions of Mindanao, na hindi Davao, right? Now, their solution is charter change. Their solution is that pag pinalitan mo yung mga provisions natin, alright, that have to do with charter change, uh, sorry, with, with economic provisions, automatically everything will be happy. Now, ito kasi yung problema. Pag tinignan mo yung datos, ang Pilipinas is getting far lower FDI than our neighbors at napag-iwanan tayo. Interestingly though, pag tinignan mo yung mga batas ng mga moonlad na bansa or tingnan mo yung mga batas ng especially mga fast-growing countries, katulad ng uh, Vietnam, they don't make foreign investment actually that easy and they also have some levels of restrictions. All right, uh, we shall uh, we shall post later on it. Dito may magandang link dito, no? So I'll I'll send this link to you guys, but you can see that. Um, kasi one by one and dito yun eh, yung mga restrictions sa media sector, restrictions sa land sector. So you can see all of these things on your own. So actually, both China and Vietnam, which are technically communist countries, parin, they also have some very strict laws and regulations on private property, right? Because at the, at the end of the day, they're supposed to be not a cap fully capitalist country, right? And even other very successful, uh, economically successful countries have various forms of restrictions on foreign investments in the interest of national security or in the interest of developing itinatawag na infant industry. So, pag pinag-aralan mo itong issue na ito, klarong-klaro na sobrang liit right ang correlation between restrictions on foreign investments in the sense that the proponents of Chacha understand it and actual investment flow I'll, I'll, I'm trying to just pull out the exact uh, data and all of you have this will be an interesting oh, kasi alam ko marami mga syunga dyan na, <laughs> nagmama ah yan yeah, sakto lumabas okay ah ito ah Vietnam Foreign ownership restrictions in telecom is 49%, railways is 49%, airports is 30%, and expressways is 51%. Alright? Check na itong data na pinos ni, uh, ni Sony Africa among others. You can check it also on your own. I'll post it to you guys, uh, yung link dito. So ito, uh, ulitin natin na, uh, Vietnam, which is growing way faster than the Philippines, getting the top level investments, has very strict regulations in terms of foreign investments at telecoms, railways, airports, expressways, etc. Right? Now, I think one big reason for that is because Vietnam doesn't want China or some hostile country getting control of their critical sectors. Now, naintindihan ko yung frustration na ating mga kababayan kasi nangyari dito is pinaprotektahan natin yung ating ekonomiya from external investments. But at the same time, we end up with oligarchs in the Philippines controlling everything. So, so the solution there is to find a kind of a perfect mean, right? Kung saan, you open the economy just enough so that high quality investments come in, but you do not overly open it so that any hostile country can come in and take over your critical infrastructure. Tignan mo yung problema natin, for instance, sa national grid natin, na ang laki ng control ng China, right? So the national Chinese grid company has 40% stake and uh, some would say 100% engineering control, right? Kung hindi kayo naiwala sa akin, go to sources as varied as Miriam Defensor, Riza Ontiveros, and Senator Tulfo, right? All of them have raised very serious concerns about Chinese investments in some of their critical infrastructure. So, kung yung idea mo is, tanggalin mo lahat ng restrictions, good luck na lang. And many mumbo-jumbo things can happen. Now remember, As I always explain, if countries with very strict rules on investments are still getting a lot of investments, then clearly, pag ginap mo utak mo, may gets mo na if the correlation is so weak there, then definitely causality is somewhere else, right? And again, for anyone who has a basic understanding of political economy, of economic policy. For the nth time, please go and check yung mga vlogs natin on industrial and trade policy. Yun yung frustration ko. So again, ha, dun sa mga nag-wine related lahat ng mga ibang titles na natin.
Okay, let me be absolutely clear about this, guys. Let me be absolutely clear about this. This Duterte, Marcos, drama, Bartagulan, whatever, is not good for our country. I know it's good for popcorn. I know as a, as a, as a vlogger, it's good for our views and engagement. As I said, we have 6, 7, 8 million views on our videos on Instagram. To, ah, where I'm, I'm not even, I don't even have many followers there. Um, but this is not good for the country because it's distracting the president from doing the right thing. Now, I'm not saying the president has the great idea there, but the, the thing is he has to have the political capital and attention to do what is right for the country so that we get the best high-quality investments. Dahil finally, ang Japan ay tumitingin talaga sa Southeast Asian Pilipinas. Ang America tumitingin sa Pilipinas para maglagay ng semiconductor investments. Ang Europa, ang maraming bansa, even United Arab Emirates, tumitingin silang lahat sa atin. But it's one thing for them to gaze at you. It's another thing for them to commit billions of dollars over time and building our talent, etc. So unless you know we, we get the basics right, guys, we will not get what we deserve as a Filipino nation. Dahil din na drag down tayo ng mga ating mga politiko. They gave us a bad image and at the same time, they're not focused on the job. I on the ball. I should be on getting the high quality semiconductor investments. High quality manufacturing EV car production investments. And for me, ultimately, the I should be on pushing our oligarchs and our big businesses to build world class industries. So I'll try to end on this point. Actually, Karina sa Ginza tayo, and I, I, I dropped by Seiko, Seiko, Seiko Museum, alright? And if you look at the origins of Seiko, mga ano to eh, just over 100 years ago yung Seiko niya, no? And if you look at the origin stories of Seiko, yung founder ng Seiko, someone who came from middle class, someone who worked his way up, and this is where the big difference with our oligarchs comes in. Right. Our oligarchs, I don't know, siguro galing sa hirap yung isa and then gumawa ng malaking business, umaman siya, puro na lang ginawa niya, real estate, retail, tapos kinakontraktual na lang yung mga workers and then bibili ng mga, uh, mga kung ano na sa China, buy and sell lang, walang innovation, walang, walang new product. Yung sa Seiko ng Japan, by 1890s pa lang nagsimula ito, by 1910-1920s, they were already a major producer. They were exporting hundreds of thousands of watches to Europe and all around the world. So you had, you, so yun yung difference eh, na, oh, hindi ko sinabi kung sino yung mga yan. <laughs> ako kasi nung nandun ako sa museum, wait lang, 1890s, may mga kilala kong mga big conglomerates sa Pilipinas na magto 200 years na sila. Alright, magto 200 years na yung iba dyan. Yung iba dyan, at least 50 years. Yung iba, 100 years. So, I was thinking, bakit hindi yun ang ginawa na ating mga oligarchs, ating mga big business sector people? They had 50 years, 100 years, some 200 years. We don't even, we don't even make watches, right? Forget about cars, forget about avionics, uh, forget about, I don't know, semiconductors, whatever. But I, well, b relatively basic things, diba? So, so that makes you wonder what's going on. So on one hand, there is this aspect, kasi guys, of commitment uh, to competing with the best of the best in the most important fields. Yun yung meron sa elite ng Japan, na wala tayo. Walang innovation talaga yung... Ang innovation lang nila, how to make more profits out of making basic raw materials or I don't know, making some condominiums like, you know, kind of tunas or... You, you get what I'm saying? Or, you know, like mall, 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 right? That's not... That's not invasion, guys. That's not high-end, uh, high-value-added production. But the other thing, I would try to be also fair here to some of our at least oligarchs who have, I think, good, who had or now have better intention is that at least in Japan, there was also this environment of other um, patriotic-minded uh, uh, innovators and businessmen. There was also this state-driven strategy, right? Uh, and the Zaibatsu, the conglomerates in Japan, were really there to create world-class industries, right? So there was also constant subsidy and support and coordination coming from Japan, and that's why we mentioned that in METI, Ministry of Economy, Trade, and Industry, 
which which comes of course later on pa. It plays a very important role in Japan's reconstruction. So on titik na mga Pilipinas, we don't have any of them. We don't have this kind of parang fine founder of Saiko or Toyota or Honda. I can come up with many who come from very humble beginnings. And then once medyo umangat sila, immediately they try to go and compete with the best of the best in the world. And they work so hard and they innovate and they try to compete and they try to learn things. They try to beat the Europeans in their own game, right? It's just incredible. I was just looking at some of the watches that came out by Seiko in the 60s, 70s, 80s. Yung iba, pwede may connect sa TV, sa computer. Grabe yung mga innovations na ginawa nila. They were beating the Europeans in their own game. And that's just the story of one innovator in Japan. We can talk about Honda, Toyota. I can go on and on and on. And guess what? You go to Korea, the story is even more incredible. Some of their big industries started in 60s, 70s, 80s. Uh, we can talk about Samsung and LG and all of that. But we know also they were pushed. So, ito yung sinasabi ko guys, our politics is perhaps one of the most entertaining. Our politicians are very entertaining, perhaps at their own expense sometimes like that. Pero kawawang Pilipinas in the meantime because sayang. I think the Philippines has this unique opportunity, really, really unique and important opportunity to get the high quality investments from all around the world. We are on the map. You know, when I go abroad, when I talk to, to others, they really want to invest in the Philippines. Nasasayangan sila sa atin. Pero paano naman natin magawa yung kailangan natin gawin kung ganyan ang estado ng politika natin? At yung isa, sinasabi niya, nagpa-fentanil yung isa. Yung isa, sinasabi niya, ganyan yung isa. Yung, yung iba, gusto daw mag dahil ang cha daw ay magical. Mag-solve lang lahat ng problema natin. Ay, san, ayan na naman tayo eh. Paaralin ko nga itong mga ito. Magpapakash course nga dapat itong mga ito sa Meti sa Japan eh. Diyos ko, wag, yun na kailangan mag ano. You know what I'm saying, guys? So, yun. Now you can see the connection between semi-different. So, our messy politics, lack of leadership, absence almost of proactive industrial policy, and the nature of the oligarchs we have, all of this have combined to make us, the ordinary Filipinos, suffer. It explains why ordinary Filipinos who work so hard, who are so loved all around the world, who are so respected all around the world, they have to live with super expensive right cost of living and then one of the lowest levels of income this is scandalous this is crazy and something has to be done about it there is a ray of hope there is some good opportunity here but i hope tayorin we also encourage our leaders to move in the right direction as much as we are we some of us are having too much fun with house of duterte versus house of marcus etc Please, wag din natin kalimutan. Na at the end of the day, we need our president to do the right thing. And we have to push them to do the right thing. On that note, thank you very much, guys. Kailangan kong makabul doon sa mga ibang ano na gagawin natin. On that note, again, salamat. Pasensya na ako, medyo late tayo nag-start. Medyo hindi ako super coherent. Ang dami kong ginawa. I walk again. 20,000. Okay, tatlong araw na yan. Uh, naka, ano, 40 kilometers walk na tayo over the past 2-3 days. Okay. So I just have to gather my energies and all of that and uh, talk to you soon. God bless. Yeah, yes, I'll post the other links. Okay? That's it.